Everyone thought he was a lonely orphan, but he turns out to be the strongest archdemon and marries a beautiful white elf. The story starts with a knight who corners a woman in the woods and attacks her with a knife. The girl screams for help before trying to slap him away, but to her absolute shock and horror, the moment her hand touches his face, the entire skin on his head comes off, revealing a grueling layer of red flesh underneath. The knight reveals that he is a sorcerer who wants to cut up and use her pretty face to fulfill one of his spells. Just as he's about to stab her, someone approaches him from behind and grabs him by the head. The sorcerer asks in shock who it is, only for the brown-haired man named Zakin to ask the same question back at him. Zakin tells him that he was trying to get some sleep, but all the shouting in his territory ruined his slumber. The sorcerer realizes Zakin is a fellow sorcerer, and he messed up by trespassing in his territory. So he tries to sweet talk Zakin by saying that if he lets him go, he will share the powerful sorcery secrets he discovered from his research. Zakin coldly replies that he does not need to learn any magic that requires hurting people and crushes his head in his hands, squirting blood all over the girl, who simply gets knocked unconscious because of the shock. Zakin immediately realizes that he might have gone too far, and has definitely given her some PTSD. He uses magic to clean up the crime scene so that everything reverts to normal. The blood on the girl's face gets off, while the knight gets his face back and lies on the ground dead. After this, he notices that the woman is wearing a cross and realizes that she is from the church, which is bad news because the worshippers are the sworn enemies of sorcerers, and despite saving her, he might be blamed for the attack. Still, Zakin decides it doesn't matter to him and decides to finish the job by translocating her to another village while hoping that the girl will think it was all a dream when she wakes up. He tries to finish his casting circle, but something interferes with his magic, causing it to fail. He turns around immediately to find another very powerful sorcerer named Barb appear in front of him. Barb looks at the strange scene and asks him what happened. Zakin explains that he was just teaching a lesson to a creep who wandered into his territory. Barb disagrees with him about calling the other sorcerer a creep because the sole purpose of sorcerers is to pursue power and other people are just fuel to be used to become stronger. Zakin stays silent at this statement when Barb senses that the woman on the ground has a lot of mana coming out of her and that they should use it in their magic. But Zakin refuses by saying that he is not interested in sacrificial magic and creates a magic portal again to translocate the girl to a nearby village. He tries to return to his chambers to follow through on his much-needed nap, but Barb insists he has come to Zakin for a good reason. He reveals that one of the thirteen archdemons has died, which is enough to get Zakin's attention. The archdemons are the pinnacle of sorcery, and those who earn the title have boosted mana and the power to command lower-ranked sorcerers. Barb explains that the strongest archdemon named Marco who lived a whole thousand years died, and there is going to be a huge auction for his possessions in his territory. This convinces Zakin to go there, but he's pissed to have Barb come along with him because he knows that Barb's only invited him so he can be a leech and use his money to buy things. They reach the archdemon's territory which is a bustling city named Kainoids. It is already overflowing with people who've come for the auction, selling and buying goods while a bunch of slaves sit in a dark alleyway awaiting their future masters. Zakin notices the tight security, and Barb explains that lately, some sorcerers have been abducting a lot of girls with huge amounts of mana to use in his sorcery, which has caused a panic. Zakin wonders why anybody would want to do something so risky and pick a fight against the church, suspecting that they must be planning to summon something big like a demon. The two enter the auction hall and take their seats as the moderator tries to auction off the items to the riled up audience. Barb points out they are in the midst of a celebrity crowd, which includes some of the most powerful sorcerers who are being considered as candidates for the late Marco Archdemon's seat. Zakin asks how the successors are decided, to which Barb replies that the remaining twelve Archdemons will debate and decide who the, the worthiest sorcerer is to receive the throne. Eventually, the moderator hypes up the crowd for the final item in the auction, which is revealed to be a purebred elf, a rare race of magical beings who are closer to gods and nature beings than humans. The moment Zakin lays eyes on her, he is overwhelmed by her beauty and his heart starts racing. The moderator starts the bid at $10,000, and Zakin immediately calls $1 million, which surprises every single person including Barb who tells him that it is too much money even for an elf and asks what crazy sorcery he's planning to use her for. 
Zakin merely gives a smile so unsettling that it even creeps Barb out. He immediately jumps down to look closely at the elf and notices a chain around her neck. The moderator tells him it must be there to stop her from escaping, but nobody has been successful at breaking the collar. Later that night, deep inside the forest where Zakin's castle is, he decides to try and have a conversation, but his years of being an incel have made it impossible for him to learn how to talk to women. Before he could say anything thankfully, the elf speaks up and requests him to let her ask a question. He is immediately struck by the sweetness of her voice, and he tries to play it cool, but instead sounds annoyed when he tells her to ask away. She introduces herself as Nephi, and with sad eyes, asks him how she is going to die. Zakin is shocked over her grave misunderstanding, and he immediately tells her that he is not going to kill her which makes her believe that she will have a fate worse than death after seeing the torture devices in the womb. Zakin gets embarrassed because he never got rid of the previous owner's things because he was too lazy to. He gives the excuse that they are just for decoration, and insists that even though he is a sorcerer, he has no interest in torturing or killing her for any reason whatsoever. He asks whether she has a family, but she claims that she is an orphan and also a cursed child, but does not explain further. She then asks that if not for sacrificing or torturing, why did he buy her? And because he can't openly simp for her yet, he tells her that she doesn't need to know that. He walks up to her and tells her that they should look around for a room where she could stay. She interprets this as him saying she will pick where she dies, making him realize that this girl was probably enslaved at a very young age and was told all her life that she would be sold to a sorcerer who would sacrifice her, making it the only thing she believes. This reminds him of his own difficult childhood when he was an orphan and had to steal and fight for food, which makes him more sympathetic towards her. He tells her that he wants her alive because he needs her, which surprises her because no one has ever told her that they need her. He then starts taking her upstairs and asks her if she is scared of heights. She tells him that SH will let him hang her any way he wants, but the baffled Zakin yells at her to shut up about torture. She apologizes for her old habit and suddenly slips but he catches her arm and drags her upstairs. Finally, he opens a room at the top of the tower and claims that she could have it only to be horrified as he sees a guillotine machine and a pile of skulls inside. She gets confused by his mixed signals and again offers her head, but he quickly creates a small energy blast and completely destroys everything inside the room, leaving it empty. They both go inside and Nephi for once seems interested as she goes into the balcony to look at the moon. Zakin is relieved to see emotion on her face, but is disappointed that he can't use sorcery to get the moon for her. Suddenly Nephi asks whether she could stay in this room and Zakin happily agrees, starting their friendship. Nephi wasn't able to sleep in her room because it was so inhospitable so she slept by Zakin's throne while he was unable to sleep due to nervousness as he has never been this close to a girl before. By the time sun comes up, he decides to get some breakfast while Nephi finally stirs awake and folds Zakin's cape which she used as a blanket. Zakin soon walks back with some breakfast while Nephi immediately greets him with a good morning. It turns out that no one has greeted him before so he gets confused as to what he should say in return and simply tells her that he got food with a scowl and immediately regrets it. They both belong to the floor gang and start chowing down while Zakin thinks about why he is such a big failure. Nephi notices that he is eating the same thing as she is, which confuses her, and she asks about it. This makes him realize that the food that he is eating is way too plain and only slaves and pigs eat like this. He realizes that he will always be a disappointment and starts eating the piece of jerky again when he suddenly remembers that this is the only food he has ever known in his life because when he was a young orphan, this was all he could afford and maybe a piece of moldy bread. He wonders what kind of food normal people might eat when suddenly Nephi speaks up and asks permission to cook food for him. This takes him by surprise as he never imagined he could ever get an anime waifu who would cook him food. He immediately dons his cape and tells Nephi that they are going into the town to get some groceries. They soon call an Uber but he suddenly realizes that he has no money as he used every single penny to buy Nephi. He immediately acts like a health freak mom and tells Nephi that they are going to walk. He starts thinking about ways to get money and wonders whether he should just threaten the cab driver, when suddenly he hears a bunch of commotion and turns around to see a bunch of robbers robbing the Uber guy on knife points. They start capturing the passengers to sell them into slavery, 
when Zakin notices that this seems to be triggering Nefi's PTSD as she also probably got enslaved like this. He decides to show Nefi how cringe robbers are, and uses his magic spell to send a blast of lightning as a warning which scares the shit out of the goons who immediately decide to rush him at once. A fat-ass fatty tries to attack him with his axe, but Zakin styles on him by stopping his blow with two fingers before shattering his axe into small pieces. He then pretends to punch the goon, but flicks him instead which is enough to blast him back on top of another robber. The hooligans start crying like little b****s just like any other bully and call for help, when suddenly a sorcerer emerges from thin air. It turns out that these goons hired the sorcerer to help them and the hooded idiot immediately tries to scare Zakin by producing a magic circle filled with burning hot flames. But our archdemon is completely unfazed and swipes away the entire flame wall without any effort. This surprises the hooded idiot, who immediately tries to land a follow-up attack. But to his surprise, his magic circle has been nullified and now is in Zakin's control as he simply walks ahead and uses a single finger to bring a lightning blast so extremely strong that it leaves a crater behind at the place where the hooded guy was standing. Then he turns towards the robbers, asking them to come at him, which scares the crap out of them as they start running away. He then turns towards Nephi again, hoping to impress her and says that she shouldn't be worried about these bullies, as everyone knows they are lame. To his utter surprise the people near the cab immediately start thanking her for saving them while the disgusting furry gives him a bag of silver coins as a thanks and also asks him to give them his protection for the rest of the way to the town. He can't believe that money can be earned this easily, as he remembers that he has destroyed a lot of robbers in his hood, but no one thanked him before, but immediately realizes that it is all because of Nephi, as he looks less scary with a cute girl. On the way to the town, Nephi asks why he helps these people, and while trying to say something smooth, he ends up making a fool of himself once again. Upon reaching the town, he starts thinking where to go when he realizes that he doesn't know anything about the stuff that girls need for daily life, and even if he asks Nephi what she wants, she won't demand anything. He suddenly notices a tailor's shop and decides to head inside alongside Nephi, as the furry shopkeeper immediately gets scared after seeing a sorcerer come in. Zakin is pretty used to this, so he simply pulls Nephi forward and tells the furry to get a dress for her. The furry is entranced by her beauty, but also notices the slave collar around her neck. She acts all cheery and takes Nephi back into the changing room before dressing her up in an extremely skimpy dress which my ex wore when she went to meet her guy best friends. Zakin gets embarrassed and tells the furry to immediately put some clothes on her otherwise he will burn his shop to the ground. The furry immediately goes back in and soon comes out with Nephi dressed in a beautiful maid's outfit. The furry explains that the dress is made up of high quality silk, while the boots have healing properties for her. Zakin asks whether she likes the dress, and for once Nephi tells him that she does like it. After buying the dress they head over next to a blacksmith's place who also gets scared of him, but feels better after looking at the pretty Nephi. He tells the smith that he wants him to remove Nephi's collar, which surprises the smith a bit, but he looks at it regardless, before telling Zakin that the collar has strong magic and cannot be removed very easily. He then tells Zakin that the collar shouldn't be removed forcefully as it might end up killing her, he asks what could be the best way to remove it and the smith tells him to look for the original key. Zakin remembers that even the moderator at the auction didn't have the key either, so it might become a problem. Zakin thanks the smith and gives him some money, but the guy refuses to take payment and reminds him that once he got attacked by a bunch of robbers while he was pulling up to Zakin's crib, and at that time he saved his ass and destroyed the robbers while the smith and his daughter were too scared to even thank him properly and just ran away. Zakin tells him not to worry about such small problems and leaves alongside Nephi. By the time they get all of the grocery items, it's already evening, so Zakin decides to eat out tonight and takes Nephi to a nearby restaurant. They both sit down together at the table, as food is brought up to them, but he notices that Nephi seems very uncomfortable. She reveals that all her life she has never eaten like this, while Zakin thinks how alike they are in terms of their childhood. He reassures her and she tastes the small tomato which blows her mind away, and to thank Zakin, she also feeds him with her own spoon, while Zakin feeds her as they start acting like cringy love-struck teens. The other customers laugh at them which makes them insecure and they quickly leave into the night and head back to the castle.
The next morning, Zakin wakes up to find Nephi standing in front of him with a smile, asking whether he would like to have some breakfast. Zakin gets up surprised but happy, asking if Nephi really made food for him, and she tells him that she did, and it's in the dining hall. He starts walking ahead. He is stunned the moment he sees the dining hall as it looks straight out of a fairy tale, as it used to resemble a graveyard, but Nephi renovated and cleaned it completely. He walks towards the chair only to see a piece of freshly baked bread on the table, which surprises him as they never bought bread, but Nephi replies that she made it fresh for him. He gets really excited to taste her food and sits down while she pours out some tea for him. He asks whether she has eaten already, but she shakes her head, so Zakin tells her to join him on the table, but she replies that she only made food for him, as she forgot to make anything for herself. Zakin tells her to share half of his food, but notices that there is only one chair, so he asks her to sit on his lap. They both get embarrassed, but Nephi finally sits on his lap, as he feeds her from his own hands, while she returns the favor by feeding him some soup as he tells her that they will be eating all meals together from now on. A couple days pass by and Zakin was busy reading books while perched on the stairs in his library. When Nephi comes in and asks what he studies all the time, he tells her that it is sorcery and magic spells that he is learning and points towards some magical figures on a paper. He asks whether elven sorcery is different, but Nephi claims with a sad face that she can't use sorcery. Zakin finds it weird as she has a lot of mana compared to any normal person, but proceeds to show her the basics by drawing a magic symbol and channeling some of his mana inside to create a small bolt of lightning. He then tells her that you can add things into the circle like the time of which the magic will activate, the area it will cover etc, and the more mana they put in, the stronger the spell is. He then shows her once again by putting some mana into the circle, creating an even bigger blast than before. He tells her that anyone with mana and the knowledge of magic circles can do sorcery with some practice, but tells her that only the original caster can use their own magic circle unless and until the level difference in between is very high. Then the person with the higher level and mana pool can take control of the weaker person's circle. She then asks why has he been drawing only on the outside of the circle, and not inside. Zakin likes the question and tells her that they can draw an entirely different magic circle inside another magic circle, but most of the times either the spell will never work, or the spell will malfunction causing a lot of damage. Only a person who has completely mastered the control of their mana can create something like this, and this will also make them be able to hijack anyone's magic circle, essentially making them the strongest sorcerer on earth. He tells him that lots of people have tried, but all of them have failed as it is an incredibly difficult task. He then sits down on his chair, while Nephi asks him what he is going to do with his incredible powers. Zakin thinks about it, but replies that he is just going to try and survive. He continues to tell Nephi that when he was young, he had no money or friends that could help him. He was truly alone in this world who stole to survive, but one day, a sorcerer captured him and put him inside his dungeon to be used as a sacrifice. But just before he was about to be sacrificed, Zakin managed to turn the tables and killed the sorcerer instead. Nephi tells him sadly that she was never able to be that strong and just when Zakin was going to comfort her. He senses some intruder on the property, which sours his mood completely. He tells Nephi to stay inside and cook dinner while he deals with some of the uninvited guests. The intruders turned out to be knights from the church, while the Lady Paladin uses her sacred sword to slice through Zakin's defensive barrier and walks inside alongside her underlings. Zakin immediately appears in front of the gate with a bang and starts trash-talking the church, which pisses knights off, but the Paladin stops them from doing anything. Zakin realizes that the paladin looks similar to someone he has seen before, while he notices that she possesses one of the twelve sacred swords that are incredibly strong and a symbol of the church's power. He suddenly realizes that the paladin is the same girl who he saved the other day by that weird faceless molester knight, and thinks about how he would have killed her if he knew she was a paladin. Zakin tells them to piss off and uses a basic magic spell at the paladin but one of the knights immediately jump forward with his shield and blocks the attack. Zakin knows that he didn't use his full power, but he was still impressed by the knights. The black-haired shield guy shouts at him for attacking them, but Zakin insults him to his face, angering him as he swings a huge axe at him, only for Zakin to hit him with a magic punch, shattering his armor and blasting him away. He tells them to leave his property immediately, 
but the blondie doesn't listen and try to swing his sword at him, only for Zakan to snap the sword in half with his fingers and as he then flicks the man in the head, knocking him out. He puts his foot on the knight's face and tells the paladin to stay at her place otherwise he will crush this one's face. She puts her sword down and asks why is he trying to torture them instead of killing them. Zakan replies that if he kills them the church will send someone else, but if he hurts them, they will tell the story to everyone and people will start fearing his powers. The paladin realizes that Zakan is bluffing as he doesn't want to kill anyone so she takes her sword out and swears to kill him. Zakan creates a magic circle, but she rushes forward and slashes the circle in half, surprising Zakan with her strength. She keeps running forward while attacking, but Zakan calmly dodges all her attacks and tells her that he doesn't fight women, and also because she reminds him of Nephi. She calls him evil just because he uses sorcery and vows to destroy all the sorcerers, while Zakan calls her hypocrisy out and claims that she is using her powers to kill sorcerers without caring for whether they are innocent or not which makes her the evil person. The girl gets triggered and rushes forward with an attack, but Zakan dodges and puts his feet on the sword. The paladin is able to get it free and thrusts the sword at Zakan, but he manages to stop it with his magic and grabs it in his hands. The paladin however is very strong and simply flings Zakan in the air and towards a tree, hurting his hands. She then immediately rushes forward to finish the job, but Zakan dodges the strike and grabs her blade. To his surprise, she whispers to him that he needs to pretend that he got killed by her otherwise the church will never let him live in peace and send another stronger paladin to kill him. Zakan asks why he should believe a paladin, and she replies that he didn't kill her men, and also saved her life before. Zakan realizes that if anyone finds out about this, she will die a horrific death at the church's hands. He was contemplating whether to accept the offer when suddenly Nephi came running out towards Zakan. He shouts at her to get back, but he is too late as one of the knights throws his spear at her, thinking that she is a sorcerer as well. Zakan rushes forward and pushes her out of the way just in time, while the spear stabs him in the hand. He takes the spear out when he suddenly feels a very strong presence. The trees around the start moving as Nephi stands up with anger burning in her eyes and tells them that they will pay for hurting Zakan. Suddenly roots start coming out of the ground and catches the knight before lifting him up in the air. Zakan tries to stop Nephi, and when she finally snaps out of it, she is horrified to see that she almost killed all the knights and the paladin as they look at her with fear in their eyes as they finally saw what Nephi was capable of. Later that night Nephi bandages Zakan's hands as he thinks about how the paladin apologized for getting Nephi involved and left afterwards. He then turns towards Nephi and asks why she didn't tell him that she could use magic. She responds that it wasn't magic, but something called mysticism. Zakan remembers reading about it, but thought it was just a myth because it defies all laws of magic. Nephi continues that she is the only elf who could use this because she was cursed when she was born. She is the only elf who had white hair and was able to talk to animals and trees alike, and because of that people called her a freak and hated her. One day their village got attacked and all the villagers told her to defend the village with her freak powers, but she decided to surrender while the entire village was slaughtered. She tells Zekin that she felt happy when the villagers who tormented her the entire life were getting killed, and then cries about how bad of a person she is to think like this. Zakan however tells her that he thinks she did very well, as if it was him, he would have killed all the villagers and the attackers himself. She was expecting him to kick her out of the castle when he realized that she was cursed, but instead, he holds her face and tells her that she will always stay with him as he can't live without her food anymore. Nephi starts crying out of relief while Zakan tries to comfort her. After a short while, Zakan is finally able to quiet her down and they both sit opposite to each other. Nephi feels pretty embarrassed for crying like that in front of her master, but Zakan reassures her that he liked how talkative she was today, whereas usually she doesn't speak much. Nephi's attention gets drawn to his hands, and she asks whether they are really badly damaged. Zakan finally remembers about his hands, but claims that they don't seem to hurt anymore. He takes out the bandages, and to his surprise the wounds have disappeared completely. He asks Nephi whether this was her doing, but she refuses, saying that she didn't do anything. Zakan realizes that Nephi has a lot of dormant powers and she must have healed him unknowingly when he was holding her head in his arms. He thanks Nephi for healing him, which seems to stun her for a bit. Zakan asks whether everything is okay, 
and she replies that he has never thanked her before, that's why she was caught off guard. Zakin feels terrible as he realizes how mean he must have looked to never say a word of thanks when she was cooking and taking care of him every single day. He immediately apologizes to her, but she claims that he is her master and is never really supposed to say thanks or sorry. Later that night Zakin rests on his throne thinking about the long day that he just had, when he spots Nephi standing behind a pillar. She looks at him with an embarrassed face and asks whether he would like to sleep with him. This catches Zakin off guard who doesn't understand why would a beautiful woman like her ask him to sleep with her. He confirms with her whether she knows what she is saying. Nephi innocently replies that there is only one bed in the entire castle and that two Zakin has given to her so that she can sleep comfortably while he stays all night on his uncomfortable throne and she thought it might be more comfortable for him to sleep in the bed with her. Zakin thinks about how pure Nephi is and then tells her that he stays up on the throne all night to make sure the barriers are maintained and no enemies try to sneak in the castle, hoping to catch him off guard. She quickly understands the situation and sits down on the floor, asking him to lay his head on her lap so at least he can be a bit more comfortable than he is on the chair. Zakin can't believe that he is being offered a lap pillow and knows that only an idiot will refuse a lap pillow, so he gladly accepts. He asks why is she so nice to him, and she replies that even after knowing that she is cursed, he still told her that he wanted her by his side, and also accepted his mystic powers, which she can't thank him enough for. Zakin tells her that she never needs to thank him for anything before putting his hands on her cheek as he asks whether she wants to learn how to use magic properly. He claims that from what he saw today, he knows that she doesn't have a lot of control over her sorcery, but the amount of mana she released was incredible especially considering that a huge chunk of it was subdued because of her collar. He can't promise that learning basic sorcery would help her gain control over her mystic powers, but at least she will be able to defend herself better. She asks whether she would be able to protect him from trouble as well, and Zakin calmly replies that she already protected him from those knights from the church today. She thanks him for accepting her as his apprentice and tells him that a lot of people might not be able to understand him and think that he is cruel but she knows and believes that he is a kind person who cares about the weak. She immediately hugs him while this moves Zakin so much that tears form in the eyes of one of the strongest demons in this world as he thinks how nice it is to have someone in your life. The next morning while he was having his tea, Barb walks in the room and asks whether he is fine as he heard the news that Zakin was attacked by the church. Zakin claims that he was attacked but the knights were very weak. Barb tells him that he also heard that one of them had a sacred sword and Zakin tells him that the paladin girl did have the sword and was pretty strong as she destroyed a couple of barriers around the castle. While they were talking Nephi brings him some tea and he suddenly remembers her from the auction spilling his tea. Zakin quickly uses his magic to catch the spill while Barb asks whether it's the same elf that he bought for so much money. Zakin claims that it is when Barb asks why hasn't he sacrificed her yet Zakin replies that he is not a barbarian and instead he has taken her as an apprentice. Barb sits down again as he realizes that with an elf by his side, Zakin can probably use every single kind of magic known to man. Zakin feels annoyed that he is talking about Nephi as an object and claims that it was Nephi who scared the knights away by her magic. Barb remembers the mess he saw outside and asks Zakin whether he is after the archdemon's seat. Zakin thinks about how he only needs the key to free Nephi but lies about it and replies that he does want the seat. He knows himself that he is unlikely to be chosen because he started learning about magic just 10 years ago, whereas other sorcerers have been studying about magic and its properties for 100s of years and have amassed a great knowledge which he can't even come close to. Barb finally gets up and leaves while Nephi asks whether he is Zakin's friend. Zakin immediately declines by saying that he doesn't have any friends, but Nephi claims that he seemed to be having fun talking to him. Later that day he takes Nephi out to fix the magic barriers that were destroyed by the paladin in the hopes that she can learn something from it. After that day, Nephi started learning about sorcery while doing all the household chores as well. She learned all about the basic magic circles and often cooked food so nice that Zakin wanted to kiss her hands. He also tired training her in her mystic arts, but unfortunately, that didn't seem to be going as well, as she still didn't have a lot of control over it. Soon Nephi learned all the basics of sorcery, and Zakin told her that she knows enough magic to do some basic spells. 
She gets overjoyed by this praise and tells him that she will make a wonderful dinner as a celebration. Soon a month passes by since he started living with her when a magic bird tries to enter Zakin's barrier, but he stops it using his magic circle. The two-headed bird calmly delivers a small envelope to him and flies away immediately. Zakin opens the letter only to find that he got summoned by the twelve archdemons to present himself in the city of the sorcerers. The next morning he goes down to the city and enters an underground lair which was used by the previous thirteenth archdemon as his castle. He enters a huge door only to find it completely jam-packed with all kinds of sorcerers. The moment he presents himself, one of the archdemons speaks up and Zakin immediately feels the immense pressure and the intensity of their magic power as they overwhelm him completely. They start talking about how young he is, when Zakin pulls himself back together and with a fake bravado asks the archdemons whether they brought him here just to waste his time or do they have something to say to him. One of the archdemon commends his bravery for speaking to them like this and cuts to the chase telling him that he has been selected for the position of the 13th Archdemon. Immediately after that the Archdemon produces a red magical crest in the air with such an immense amount of mana concentrated inside of it that Zakin starts feeling sick. The Archdemons claim that this crest belonged to the previous 13th Archdemon and if Zakin accepts, it will be passed onto him alongside its power and prestige. Zakin looks at the Archdemons and asks why they have chosen him, as there are sorcerers who are much older, more knowledgeable and even powerful than him. The Archdemon agrees that Zakin's powers are still very weak, but the fact is that he has some latent abilities which are so powerful that none of the sorcerers here including the Archdemons can kill him. He continues that Zakin was only eight when he killed a very well-known sorcerer who was not weak by any means. Even though Zakin was a child with no magical power, he was able to understand the flow of mana and the technique behind the magic just by observing it once and produced an even more powerful spell to kill the sorcerer to earn his freedom. The archdemon tells him that his sorcery is so unique and powerful that he can overpower any sorcerer in the world and no one could do anything about it. He can take anything he wants from them and none could stand his powers. He continues that if Zakin is so strong at such a young age, then he will definitely become one of the greatest sorcerers to ever exist in the world when he grows older. Zakin looks at them and asks if he is so strong, then he could just kill all of them and take all their belongings. This makes the archdemons laugh, as one of the old archdemon tells Zakin to be mindful of where he is standing. She claims that Zakin is strong indeed, but if he tries to cross them, they will take every single thing Zakin holds dear let it be his home, his friends, his family or anyone he ever knew, till he is left alone and forgotten with nothing to his name. He immediately thinks about Nephi and how he couldn't put her life in any danger. He starts thinking about his options as he knew from the day that he became a sorcerer that a normal life is something he cannot have, but becoming an archdemon will mean that he will be diving into a darker path altogether. He knows that Nephi doesn't deserve to walk this path as she will just suffer because of this darkness. The archdemon pulls him out of his thoughts and asks him for an answer. Zakin looks at him and puts a condition for accepting the title. The archdemon asks what more could he want than the title of one of the archdemons and Zakin replies that he wants all the possessions of the previous archdemon. The sorcerer agrees to the arrangement and produces the crest before Zakin absorbs it on his hand, officially becoming the thirteenth archdemon of the world. That night he returns back to his castle where Nephi was happily cooking him a lamb stew which he loves. Nephi happily greets him but notices that something seems off about him. He claims that he went to meet the other archdemons and now has the property of the previous archdemon who owned Nephi. He produces a key and immediately unlocks the slave collar on Nephi's neck which falls to the ground immediately. Before she could even process what was happening, he tells her that he is now the 13th archdemon and has no further use of her before kicking her out of the castle. Nephi sits down on an empty alleyway in the middle of the night, unable to process what just happened to her. She gets up to go back to the castle, but finds the broken slave collar, remembering that her master, who told her that he would never leave her alone and wants her to stay with him forever, just kicked her out like a stray dog. Nephi wanders around unable to think of a life without her master, when suddenly a girl ends up calling her over and asks whether she is okay. Nephi looks up slowly only to realize that the girl is none other than the Lady Knight who attacked them a month ago. Nephi was in such a terrible state that she believes that the Paladin is here to take her life, but instead of running away, 
She accepts her death with open arms and tells the knight to kill her as she has no intentions of living without her master. The paladin starts backing off, telling Nephi that she has no such intentions, but Nephi walks up to her, asking whether it's not the duty of angelic knights to kill the sorcerers, and claims that she is an apprentice to a sorcerer, which means she should be killed as well. A bunch of people roaming around on the streets end up overhearing this conversation and walk in to check what's happening. Because Nephi came to the market often to get groceries, most of the townspeople end up recognizing her and think that the paladin is harassing her because Nephi works for a sorcerer. The paladin tells Nephi to shut her mouth because she is making her sound like a serial killer when she is not. But before she could say anything more, the winged woman who helped Nephi get a dress ends up arriving on the scene and tells the paladin to back off. The knight immediately tries to explain that she doesn't want to do any harm to Nephi. But the mob is already riled up and not willing to hear any excuses. They start trash talking and calling names to the paladin which turns so bad that she ends up breaking down on the floor and starts bawling her eyes out. Thankfully, Nephi steps in and tells everyone that the paladin hasn't really done anything to her, which silences the crowd as the bird woman asks Nephi why does she look so terrible then? The paladin starts crying and shouts at the crowd that she hasn't done anything and was just worried to see Nephi alone in an alleyway. The bird woman ends up taking her to a local tavern where the paladin regains her composure and introduces herself as Chastel. The bird woman calls herself Manuela and asks whether she seriously didn't do anything to Nephi, because she seems to recognize her. Nephi stops Manuela and tells her that even though they were fighting, Chastel never tried to hurt her and it was one of her subordinates that attacked. Chastel thinks about how the guy who Nephi attacked with her mystic magic got so much PTSD that he can't even look at a tiny plant now as he fears they will eat him. The tavern cook gets Nephi some food, but she claims that she doesn't have any money for it. Manuela tells her to eat up as she will take care of it, but tells Chastel that she will have to take care of her own food. Nephi tries the food and it makes her remember the lamb stew that he cooked for Zakin with so much love and tears form in her eyes immediately. She starts crying completely while Chastel asks whether she did something with a worried look. Nephi tells her that she got kicked out by Zakin and starts bawling her eyes out as both Chastel and Manuela run over to comfort her. Manuela manages to console her and after finishing her food, Nephi tells them about what happened. Chastel tells her that she thought he was a half-decent person, but now it seems like he was just using Nephi for his own benefit. Nephi however defends Zakin and claims that he is not that kind of a person. Manuela asks what happened before he kicked her out, and Nephi tells them that he came home and told her that he has become an archdemon. This surprises both of them, and they explain to Nephi that this entire town was more or less run by the 13th archdemon who was a pretty decent person. But after his death, things started getting bad and girls started getting kidnapped by sorcerers to use as a sacrifice. Chastel claims that the church believes that the archdemons are their sworn enemies, but there are only 12 sacred sword whereas the archdemons are 13 in number, which means the knights are at a disadvantage. To get an even playing field, the church tries to attack the newest member of the archdemons because they haven't gained a lot of powers yet, which means that they are easier to kill. Nephi wonders whether that is the reason why Zakin sent her away, but Chastel breaks her thought and asks whether she thinks Zakin is capable of kidnapping girls and using them for sacrifice. Nephi quickly defends Zakin claiming that he has no interest in using anyone for sacrifice and spends most of his time reading books on magic. Chastel ends up believing her as she remembers that Zakin was holding back a lot when he was fighting her just because she was a girl. She tells Nephi that when she first saw him, it looked like he was sad and needed help and compassion from a different person. Nephi completely understands what Chastel was talking about as she remembers how happy he was when she was with him, and thinks to herself that he might need her help to feel happy again and gets up from her table, claiming that she is going back to Zakin. Both Manuela and Chastel get up and ask whether she will be okay going out alone. Nephi claims that she needs to go regardless, because even though Zakin is super strong and no one can defeat him very easily, he still can get hurt and no one in this world can stay happy if they are left all alone. She turns towards them with newfound inspiration and claims that she wants to be there to support her master in his time of need. Chastel smiles and tells her in that case she will go with her and do her duty as well. Nephi gets worried and asks whether she will fight him again, but Chastel immediately tells her that she is just going to escort her to the castle. 
Moreover, she claims that there is a sorcerer who is using the name of Zakin to commit crimes, framing him in the process, and she wants to figure out who this evil sorcerer is. Suddenly the door of the tavern opens and the three knights that accompanied Chastel before appear inside. They immediately get scared to see Nephi there, and the guy with PTSD gets a stroke and falls to the ground. Suddenly the entire surrounding starts getting devoured by a darkness that no one can get away from. The darkness covers Nephi while Chastel ends up pushing Manuela away, saving her as she flies outside. A strong voice booms from the darkness that claims to be Zakin, and tells the knights that he is going to take both the girls back to his castle and sacrifice them to increase his powers. Meanwhile, Zakin looks at the moon remembering Nephi, while some knights from the church crawl on the ground totally helpless against the archdemon. They can't believe that even three high-ranking knights together can't even win with a surprise attack against Zakin. He turns around and tells them that they are not very strong and moreover, he didn't even have to do anything as they simply fell for the trap that Nephi put when she was training. This makes him feel sad, but he reminds himself that this is for the best as now no one will try to harm her, and she has made enough friends in the town that they will help her. He starts moving back to his castle, when one of the knights grabs onto his legs and tells him not to hurt Chastel as she is the only one who thinks that he is not the real kidnapper. Before he could make sense of this, Manuela ends up jumping on top of the knight who starts bickering with her. Annoyed by this, Zakin gets ready to expel all of them outside the forest, but Manuela turns towards him and shouts that Nephi has been kidnapped. He is surprised by this as he thought he distanced her at the right time, but apparently it was too late. Manuela tells him that he needs to save her, while he thinks that if he tries to save her, this would clearly show the connection between Zakin and the White Elf. Manuela gets pissed at Zakin for looking so confused when he should be rushing to save Nephi and tells him that she wanted to come back. He can't believe that she would try to come back even after he treated her so badly and kicked her out. He looks down into the earth as he tells Manuela that every single sorcerer in this world is extremely selfish and he is no exception. That is why he will find Nephi and get her back because she belongs to him and no one else. He vows to make sure that she is safe even if he is forced to sacrifice the entire world for it. He turns around and conjures a magic circle and asks Manuela whether she wants to come with him. Manuela immediately agrees but to his surprise, all the knights jump on him as well, begging him to take them as well, as they need to fight for Chastel. He tells them to get away from him so that he can at least cast the magic first and begins the preparations. Meanwhile, Nephi wakes up from her slumber, only to find herself shackled to the wall alongside Chastel. The paladin asks whether she is okay and Nephi claims that she is fine, but the shackles have blocked the flow of her mana. Suddenly a voice sounds from afar and a shadowy figure emerges who turns out to be none other than the scheming snake Barb. Nephi tells him that she thought of him as Zakin's friend, but Barb mocks her, claiming that sorcerers have no friends. He claims that Zakin killed a famous sorcerer when he was eight, and that sorcerer was none other than Barb's teacher. After that Zakin ended up inheriting the sorcerer's castle and all the money before spending it all to buy Nephi. He tells her that all the riches and the castle belongs to him and not Zakin, and he is going to fulfill his dream by becoming the 13th archdemon by sacrificing Nephi and gaining all the power he needs. Nephi opens her mouth and tells him that all his planning will be in vain because Zakin has already become the 13th archdemon. This really shocks Barb who gets pissed at the fact that even this thing that he so desired got stolen by Zakin. He angrily grabs Nephi and drags her towards a magic circle, claiming that he will gain so much power after sacrificing both of them that he will become even stronger than Zakin and crush him. He starts dragging her once again, but Nephi fights back and claims that she belongs to Zakin and is not to be touched by someone as lowly as Barb. This pisses him off and he was about to attack her with his magic. But suddenly a hole is blown through the cave as Zakin emerges from the dust, thanking Nephi for trusting him and promises that he will save her. Barb asks Zakin how long has he known that he was behind the kidnappings, and he replies that it started when he saw the face stealer. That guy was super weak and couldn't have broken through the barrier surrounding the castle on his own, so there must have been someone backing him up. Zakin knew only one guy with the habit of breaking his barriers and entering his territory, and that was Barb. Zakin knows that Barb specializes in creating pocket dimensions and transporting and summoning things using them. He remarks that just after the face stealer and the holy knights were dealt with, 
Barb showed up at his door as if to check the result. It would be stupid of him to not suspect him after all that. Barb sneers and asks why did he still welcome him and serve him tea after knowing that, and Zakin replies that he just wanted to figure out his plan. Zakin then turns his attention to Nephi, who blushes on seeing him. He declares that Barb won't be forgiven for hurting his girl and sends a magic attack towards him. Barb tries to block it, but then suddenly, Zakin leaps at him and breaks his arms with a clean strike. Next, he disables his legs and Barb falls on his knees, screaming in pain. Zakin then heads to Nephi and frees her from the shackles. He nervously asks if that hurt her, and she tears up as she runs to him. She says that she was hurt, but he looked much more hurt than her. She says that he is her master, and if he says that she is no longer needed, she should accept it. However, she doesn't want to leave him alone and in pain after knowing that he is hurt. She buries her face in his chest and asks him to not be alone again. Zakin hesitates to hug her because he feels guilty for abandoning her, but he overcomes that feeling and embraces her. In that time, Barb has recovered and he launches a sneak attack at Zakin from behind. Nephi is worried, but Zakin assures her that nothing is going to happen. The magic circle Barb just cast shatters and disappears. He tries using another magic circle, but it also turns to dust. The same thing happens no matter how many magic circles Barb uses, and he wonders why is his magic not being activated. Nephi is also confused and asks Zakin what is happening, and he reminds her about the ultimate sorcery he once told her about. The ultimate sorcery that aims to disrupt an enemy's magic circle by inserting another magic circle within is actually possible for Zakin. He shows Nephi the trick he uses, which is creating identical magic circles as Barb, and overlapping them so that they naturally cancel out. Barb freaks out and wonders if this is the legacy of the first sorcerer he killed, but Zakin tells him that if the old sorcerer could use it, he would have never died. He recites the story of how he was eight years old when the man kidnapped him, and he memorized the magic circle he used that time. Zakin claims that in a desperate attempt to save his life, he drew that circle on his palm with his blood, uncertain if it would actually work. However, when the evil sorcerer caught him while he was trying to escape and used the lightning spell on him, Zakin used it against him instinctively. Because of that, the evil sorcerer's magic circle was cancelled, and he got electrocuted by Zakin's attack. Barb declares that it was just a fluke, and he creates dozens of magic circles at once, but Zakin cancels them all within a couple of seconds. Barb has lost hope now, because some of the magic circles he just used were brand new, and Zakin had never seen them before. He asks him how he could overwrite everything so easily. Zakin tells Barb that he is a shabby third-rate sorcerer, if that was the best he could do, because even an amateur could deal with his magic with the right timing. He reveals how he was completely focused on researching magic after he became a sorcerer, and completely shut off communication with the outside world. Even his friends from the streets didn't come looking for him, but Barb did. He came to visit him every occasion he could find, and even when Zakin told him to get off his property, he did not listen. They even fought with each other, but over time, Zakin decided to accept him as an inevitable nuisance and they began getting along quite well. Barb says that he could have killed him any moment he wanted, but he was curious to see what a brat like him could accomplish. Zakin decides to give him a taste of his true abilities and summons a complex multi-layered magic circle that has absorbed all of Barb's magic circles he destroyed earlier. Barb asks him if he devoured his magic circles, and Zakin replies that it is a nice way to put it. He tells Barb that he truly was worthy of being a demon lord candidate. That reminds Zakin that when he was made the 13th demon lord, he was given a new title, the Sorcerer Slayer. Just as Zakin reveals his title to Barb, he uses the magic power stored in his complex magic circle and shoots it towards him. Barb takes a direct hit and collapses, writhing in pain. He realizes that even if he was an archdemon, he could not stop a punch from Zakin, much less defeat him. Zakin walks towards him, and Barb begs him for mercy as he accepts his defeat. He swears to give him all his knowledge and never show his face before him again, and Zakin suddenly stops. Barb tries to remind Zakin of the good old times and how they used to be friends, but he does not plan on falling for his sweet words. He hits Barb with another devastating punch, rattling the entire cave. However, when the dust settles, it turns out that he just hit the ground next to him, so as to scare him out of his wits. 
Zakin laughs and tells Barb that he doesn't need to panic because he doesn't want to kill him. The reason behind this is simple. Barb has a good eye for alcohol, and Zakin wants to continue having a taste of the fine wines he brings along. He is confident that Barb poses him no threat, but it rubs him the wrong way. He tells Zakin that if he lets him live, he will make sure to kill him, no matter how long it takes. Zakin tells him that he is free to try, but after he loses, he has to treat him to drinks. Barb is utterly baffled now, and he asks why does he not want to kill him, because there is no profit in letting him live. Zakin simply tells him that he is an archdemon now, and he will do whatever he wants. He tells Barb that if he wants to be killed so badly, he should get stronger and become a real threat to him. Nephi is pleased to see this, and in the meantime, the Manuala has saved Chastel. As soon as they step into the giant magic circle on the ground, it suddenly activates, and Zakin asks Barb if he seriously wants to proceed after getting his ass whooped just now. Barb replies that he hasn't done anything, and Zakin spots the flaw in his magic circle opened up at the place he punched earlier. Zakin yells at Nephi and other girls to run away as the magic circle begins functioning, and a large amount of mana is ejected into the air. He asks Barb what the hell was he trying to do here, and he replies that he was going to summon a real demon. Zakin is taken aback to hear that, and the mana starts taking the form of the real demon, terrifying everyone. Demons have been part of the myths of this world, and it is said that they once used to live on Earth before going to another place. No one seems to have definite proof about their existence, but it is speculated that the symbols used in magic circles by the sorcerers and those used by the church are based on knowledge of demons and gods. Zakin realizes that Barb did something outrageous by summoning a demon here, but then notices that it is an imperfect summoning. He thinks that it was because he tampered with the magic circle, and no one was sacrificed for this magic. But despite being just a shadow of its true self, he can tell how strong the demon is. Zakin loses hope as the demon's menacing aura presses him down. He realizes that the demon is much stronger than all the archdemons he faced earlier, and no matter how strong he gets, he cannot defeat it. The demon transforms its tentacles into a hand and approaches Zakin, who wonders if this is how he dies. However, instead of attacking him, the demon simply kneels before him and addresses him as his king. Zakin realizes that the demon is not reacting to him, but to the symbol of the archdemon on his hand. He wonders what kind of outrageous power has fallen into his hands, but decides to make good use of it. He commands the demon to return where it came from, because this world is not meant for him. The demon stares at him silently and then begins moving back into the magic circle, rattling the ground as he leaves. Once he is finally gone, Zakin falls to his knees and the summoning magic circle vanishes. But now, the cave has started to collapse, and Zakin immediately picks up Nephi and the other two girls. He asks Barb to grab on too, and he latches to his robe as Zakin runs out of the cave. The wreckage is about to block their exit, when suddenly, the Holy Knights with Chastel arrive there. Thanks to them, everyone is able to evacuate safely. After saving Chastel, one of the knights starts crying, while the other tries to tell Zakin that they are here just to save their leader and rescue the civilians. They insist that they have no plans of cooperating with an evil sorcerer like him, and Zakin simply tells them to go home if they are done talking. The knights curse him as they leave, and then Manuela also thanks him for saving her, before asking him to talk things out with his girl. After she has also left, Zakin turns to Barb and asks if he plans to fight him. Barb doesn't have any strength or courage to face him after seeing him subdue the demon earlier, so he just walks ahead and disappears in a black haze. With that, Zakin and Nephi are finally left alone, and they get embarrassed as soon as they realize this. She speaks first, and tells Zakin that she would like to stay by his side. He realizes that she has grown mentally and emotionally stronger, but there are some things he wants to change now. Zakin kneels before Nephi to confess his feelings to her, and to promise that he won't hurt her ever again. He tells her that she doesn't need to call him master anymore, because she is not his slave or apprentice now. He states that he wants something more for them, and then blushes, unable to utter a single word out of his mouth. Zakin cannot bring himself to tell Nephi that he loves her, so he gets up and grabs her tightly, telling her that she belongs to him. He tells her that she will always be his, even after death. Both of them blush for a moment but then Zakin falls to his knees, wondering why couldn't he just tell her that he loves her. 
However, what he just said was enough to make Nephi cry tears of joy. She pulls out the broken collar from her pocket and requests Zakin to put it back on her. She wants to wear it as a reminder of how she came into Zakin's life, and he accepts her feelings. He gently puts it around her neck, thinking that it is a bit too big for an engagement ring. They watch the sunrise together after that, and Nephi asks him what their relationship is now if she is not his slave or apprentice. He falls silent on hearing that and blushes, hoping someone will approach him with an answer. Soon after that, the news about the new archdemon spreads throughout the region. People talk about how Zakin looks scary, but is actually a decent person. Two fellow sorcerers, who were prominent archdemon candidates also hear this, but they don't seem to mind that a sorcerer much younger than them has reached a position they were eyeing. However, there are some people not too happy with Zakin becoming the new archdemon. Among them is the bishop who commands Chastil. She tells him that she wants to pull out of the mission to hunt down Zakin, and even testifies that he was being framed regarding the kidnappings. The cardinal takes her words very seriously and immediately strips her of her title as an angelic knight. Chastel realizes that the church has hit a new low because they care more about censuring her than dealing with real problems. Her underlings try to convince the cardinal that he is making a mistake, but she asks them to shut up. After seeing Zakin stand firm in what he believes in, she wants to become like him too, and faces the cardinal with determination. Chastel hands over her sacred sword to the cardinal as she resigns from her position as the angelic knight. She recalls how she was once a delusional teenager who thought that having the sacred sword will give her the power to save the world. But in the end she just became an obedient servant of the church who could not do anything by her own will. She looks sad so the cardinal tells her not to be so disheartened. He assures her that in due time, he will take back his judgment and she will be reinstated as an angelic knight. Chastel fails to understand his meaning, and the old priest tells her that sacred swords choose their wielder, and thus she is not someone they can simply discard. He puts his hand on Chastel's shoulder, promising that he will try his best to resolve this issue. However, the cardinal cannot offer her more than political protection right now. He tells Chastel that the most powerful sacred sword user named Raphael is heading towards them, and she freaks out on hearing the name. She knows Raphael as the strongest as well as the most ruthless angelic knight, and she is certain that he is coming here to dispose of her as a traitor to the church. On the other hand, Zakin is busy reading books in his library to find out more about the crest of the archdemon on his hand. He decides to take a break because he can't find anything, and then suddenly, Nephi enters the room. She is walking as silently as she can, and Zakin lets her try to surprise him. However, as she tries to close his eyes, she finds that it is impossible because he is standing on a letter. Nephi turns red on realizing that she failed, and she has no particular reason about why she wanted to surprise Zakin. Zakin finds her too cute, but as always, he can't come clean with his feelings. So he simply asks her if she wants anything, and she tells him that lunch is ready. She has prepared a full course meal for him, and Zakin is awestruck on seeing that. They both sit down to eat, and the very first bite of the food sends them to Wonderland. After that, he tastes the pudding she made, and gets blown away by its taste as well, when he suddenly notices the barrier around his castle shattering. Zakin tries attacking the intruder from a distance, but he protects himself using a barrier. The intruder is a strange lizard-like human, who uses a powerful magic spell to break through the castle's gate. He quickly makes his way to the dining room, and even Zakin is Loki impressed that he managed to pass all the traps he laid in the way. The armored lizard man is a powerful magician named Veilfer the Apparition, whom Zakin saw on the day he bought Napi in the auction. Veilfer wants to kill him and take over the position of the archdemon, but Zakin coldly tells him to wait because he is enjoying his lunch right now. Veilfer is taken aback for a moment, but then he unleashes his scaly arm, ripping apart his armor in the process. He attacks Zakin, who blocks his punch effortlessly, and when the lizard dude opens his face to fire a magic beam at him, he simply knocks him out with a palm strike. The lizard helmet falls off, and Nephi goes to check up on Veilfer. Zakin tells her to let the bastard stay unconscious on the floor, but she tells him that it is a girl. Zakin sees that the real magician inside the armor was just a kid, and he freaks out on realizing that he smacked her unconscious. However, as Nephi assures him that the girl is not in any danger, he is relieved. He carries Veilfer on his back and takes her to their spare guest room. 
The girl soon opens her eyes, and the first thing she does is punch Zakin, who blocks her puny little fist with ease. He tells her to thank Nephi before doing anything, because she is the one who convinced him not to kill her. Veilfer asks him why is he letting her live when she tried to kill him, and Zakin simply says that it was because Nephi wanted to save her life. He then asks her why she attacked him in the first place, and Veilfer nervously tells him that she wanted power because she is too weak. She knows that Zakin is the newest archdemon, and she had also heard about his reputation of cancelling magic spells. So she thought that if she didn't use any spells, she could beat him. Zakin agrees that her plan was solid because he could not have countered her racial skills with his techniques. By her strong scaly arm and the magical breath she was trying to fire, he has understood that Veilfer is a dragon. He knows that dragons can live for thousands of years and wonders why did the girl feel the need to attack him then. However, as he sees her shiver nervously before him, she reminds him of his past. He also used to go after easy-looking targets to steal food, and often got caught and beaten. That is exactly what has happened to Veilfer now. Zakin knows that there is only one correct response to her actions in that case. He declares that Veilfer will be punished for trying to attack an archdemon, but her punishment is just to assist Nephi in the household work for one week. Both Veilfer and Nephi are shocked to hear this, but Zakin just wants to teach the dragon girl some manners and decency, even if she wants to be a villain. Veilfer timidly asks him if he isn't going to eat her, and Zakin is perplexed. Her voice trembles as she remarks that humans believe that eating dragon flesh can make them stronger. Nephi is astonished on hearing this and asks Zakin if this is true, and he says that there are many ancient legends about how using dragon parts can greatly strengthen humans. He simply tells Veilfer that eating a puny little thing like her would only give him a bad aftertaste, and she is on the verge of crying. Zakin is flustered because Veilfer couldn't understand that he is a Tsundir. He recalls his past in the streets, where older kids used to share food with him when he was beaten for stealing. Zakin immediately asks Nephi if they have any leftovers, and she brings some soup for the dragon girl. Veilfer doesn't want his charity and plans to throw the food but Zakin threatens her that he hates people who waste food. He threatens to kill anyone who wastes the food Nephi cooks, and the dragon girl is scared into submission. She reluctantly takes a bite and immediately likes it. She quickly finishes the soup and Zakin tells her to start assisting Nephi after this. Veilfer asks him if he is okay with letting her be alone with his girl because then she could hurt her or escape. Zakin tells her to suit herself but warns her that messing with him will be dangerous, especially since he now knows her secret. He also warns her that Nephi is much stronger than her. Even after all the tall talk, Zakin is worried that things might become dangerous, so he cautiously spies on Nephi and Veilfer doing laundry. They seem to be getting along quite well, and Veilfer remarks that if Zakin had a wider mouth, he would be considered handsome by dragons. She is afraid of Zakin's strength but Nephi assures her that he is not a person who misuses his strength on the weak. Nephi then asks Vale for her future plans, and she says that she must become stronger by any means possible, but she can't dare to attack any other archdemon now. They keep talking and Veilfer eventually reveals that she has no home to go back to. Even Zakin feels bad for her after listening to that. Over the next few days, slowly starts getting accustomed to working with Nephi, while Zakin's investigation about the Archdemon Crest and True Demons has not produced any result yet, Veilfer comes to call him for dinner, and they soon sit down to eat. In the middle of the dinner, Veilfer abruptly apologizes for ruining Zakin's lunch when she invaded his castle. He finds her cute, but doesn't react too much. He then tells Nephi that he is going to investigate the former Archdemon's base again, and he will take the girl with him. She is flustered on hearing that and asks if he really intends to share the knowledge of the previous archdemon with her. She asks what if she steals the techniques and knowledge from him, and Zakin simply tells her that those things are meant to be stolen. Veilfer doesn't understand why he is doing this, and Zakin tells her that it doesn't matter to him that she is a long-lived dragon or a strong magician. For him, she is just a kid, and he won't mind if she does as she pleases in his home. Veilfer starts crying, and Zakin nervously ruffles her hair, telling her to stop crying and resume eating. He then tells her that if she works for him, it will be better because no one will try to attack an archdemon's underling. Veilfer blushes as she accepts his offer. She falls asleep as soon as they take her back to her room, still holding her spoon. 
Zakin takes the spoon from her hands, but Veilfer unconsciously grabs his finger and calls him daddy. Nephi smiles at Zakin and says that it seems they have a kid now. He takes a couple of seconds to react to that and turns red, and Nephi takes a few more seconds to realize the implications of what she just said. Both of them are too flustered and try to come up with excuses, but after they calm down, Zakin holds Nephi's hand, thinking about how he would love to start a normal family with her. It's been a week since Vale came to Zakin's residence, and she has been pretty well settled here as she stays with Nephi as her roommate and helps her do all the daily chores. To her surprise, she isn't treated like a slave as no one tells her to do stuff if she doesn't want to. And moreover when she completes certain tasks, she is showered with praises by Nephi. She notes it all down in her diary at night about how she doesn't know how to feel about Zakin as he is an incredibly strong demon lord, but never behaves that way as he is surprisingly gentle and introverted. She also can't understand the relationship between Nephi and Zakin as she wears a slave collar but in no way behaves like a slave as she eats on the same table as Zakin, and he even gives her personal lessons in the library so that she can also learn magic. One thing that she doesn't understand is why she sits on his lap while learning the magic spells and why Zakin cannot bring the man in him to touch her hair as he brings his hands ever so close, but pussies out at the very last moment. On the other hand, Nephi looks anxious but not upset, but pretty happy and excited as she waits for him to finally touch her hair. Even though the lord of this castle can do whatever he pleases, he stops whatever he is doing the moment Vale comes near and acts like nothing ever happened. She writes it all down in her diary at night alongside the fact that Zakin promised both her and Nephi that he will take them to the older demon lord's castle so that they can have a look around. The next morning Zakin takes Vale and Nephi to Manuela's shop who is overexcited to see the cute little girl as she immediately starts dressing her up and asks Zakin whether she could keep her forever. Zakin tells her she is not an object to give away before they all move out from her shop. Zakin already feels tired as it's such a chore to go to her shop, but he didn't have any other options as the green-haired girl didn't have anything to wear apart from her armor. Nephi breaks through her thoughts and tells him that she seems to be liking her new dress and Zakin does realize that she seems to be liking her cute little dress. Soon Vale runs back to Zakin and holds both his and Nephi's hand as she walks in between. Immediately a warm feeling wells up in Zakin, as he realizes that this feeling is different from what he feels for Nephi, and it's more of a protective feeling as someone would protect their own child. While Zakin is dealing with this dilemma, Chastel walks through the market in her normal clothes, which she hasn't worn in God knows how long. She walks while thinking about how she managed to delay the search for Zakin by not taking part in it, not divulging the details of his location, but thinks that he will probably never even know about her deed. She thinks why she did this for a demon, but at the same time she also wants him to lead a happy life with Nephi, and maybe one day have his own children, as she thinks he will make a very loving father. At the end of the day she has only one wish that when she dies they come to her grave to put some flowers. Suddenly she spots Zakin alongside Nephi with a child in between, and she mistakes it as their biological child. She runs up to them and asks how can they go all the way already, and have a child, which embarrasses both him and Nephi as Zakin replies that he hasn't done anything to Nephi yet. Vale seems confused and asks Zakin who this woman is and Zakin himself seems confused at who she is. This breaks her heart as she cries while Nephi reminds Zakin that she is Chastil the Lady Knight. He immediately remembers her but claims that he didn't recognize her as he has never seen her without her armor. Before he could introduce her properly, the three Cerulean nerds come running up to her and tell her that it's not safe for her to walk unprotected. They immediately spot Zakin who makes fun of them, while he notices that Vale seems to be on edge as she gets ready with her dragon claws to shred them. Zakin tells her to chill out and she follows his orders. After Chastel was gone, he asked her whether the knights ever hurt her, but she claims that a demon doesn't need any reason to hate the knights. Zakin thinks that it's fair enough and takes them down to the former archdemon's castle. Vale immediately seems interested as she claims that this place seems familiar, before claiming that she thinks this used to be a dragon's lair as the mana is different and her own home was like this. Zakin gets interested and opens the door with his emblem and they all walk in. They spot a magic golem who is supposed to protect this dungeon, but they move ahead and suddenly Vale spots a magic circle which she claims seems to be made by dragons. 
Zakin praises her and tells her to open the seal while he starts going to the second base with Nephi, but stops when Vale looks at them. They all venture inside and Zakin opens another gate, which leads them into a big chamber which lights up immediately. The giant chamber turns out to be an incredible library filled with books of all sorts. He gets excited about it, and tells the girls that they need to find anything that has to do with the Archdemon's emblem if possible. They start searching when Vale approaches Zakin and asks him about will she ever be able to become like him. Zakin replies that dragons live for one thousands of years, and there's a good possibility that she can become much stronger than him. Vale doubtfully looks up at him and asks whether she can live with him for the entire time. And Zakin doesn't even take his eyes off the books, as he tells her that she is welcome to stay as long as she wants and leave if she feels like it. She immediately clings to his legs and tells him that she will never leave him while Zakin wonders why is he changing so much. His thoughts are broken when Vale manages to find a tome containing information about the Twelve Sacred Swords. He immediately snatches it away from Vale and starts checking through it when he noticed that there is definitely some connection between the church and the demons. When he first saw the Sacred Sword he had a feeling that he has seen the runes somewhere, but now it's confirmed as he matches the runes in the image of the sword to his Archdemon emblem and realizes that both of them are written in the same magical language. He takes the books and tells the girls that they can have whatever book they want and leaves the place with them. Meanwhile, Chastel presents herself in the church where his nerds tell her that Sir Raphael, the legendary leader of the Sacred Knights who has slain the most amount of sorcerers, is coming soon. Suddenly, Raf presents himself in front of them, and they all bow down in front of the gigantic man. He asks who among them is the former Sacred Knight who got his sword taken away from them, and when Chastel replies that it's her, he straight up asks how many sorcerers has she killed till now. She is taken aback by his straightforwardness, but bravely replies that she doesn't think the amount of sorcerers you kill is a good judge of your character. The Cerulean nerds behind him piss their pants as they tell Chastel to speak carefully as they can't save her from him. But the huge man laughs loudly claiming that no one has ever dared to talk to him like this, especially a girl. He tells her that she can take her bravery with her to the heavens which scares Chastel, but thankfully the Pope of the Church comes at the last moment and tells Raph to back off as he doesn't have the right to kill anyone. He talks back to the Pope claiming that he doesn't talk to a politician which triggers Chastel to defend him as she tells him to talk carefully to the Pope. Raph gets mad and takes out his sword before aiming it at her as he tells the Pope that the sword chooses its master, so if he doesn't want to give her the sword, then she should die so the sword can be given to someone else. The Pope immediately goes back and hands the sword over to Chastel who expected Raph to try and fight her, but he simply leaves while she is simply left wondering in her room whether it was all his plan. Meanwhile, Zakin talks to Barb in a bar where he laughs about how he heard Zakin has adopted a child and pours him some booze before offering him to be the manager of the dungeon castle. Zakin immediately declines, but they negotiate to a point where he allows Barb to take a couple of books in exchange for information. Barb tells him that a new sacred knight who supposedly ate dragon's flesh has arrived in the city and is said to have killed 499 sorcerers till now. According to him, he was called specifically to deal with Zakin so he should watch his back. While Zakin asks how the knight looks, suddenly the door behind them opens unbeknownst to them and none other than Raf walks through as everyone watches. Barb was describing how Raf was a huge man with a scar on his face when they turned around and noticed him standing there in flesh, ready for a fight. They both turn around to see this mountain of a man staring at them, which immediately scares the living shit out of Barb, while the bartender girl simply faints at the sight of this man's smile. Barb gets up, scared as hell as he gets ready for a fight, and starts chanting spells as he walks towards Raf while he takes out his sword. But before he could do anything, Zakin uses his own magic to nullify Barb's spell. Barb looks around and asks Zakin whether he has gone crazy as this man will kill him at any moment now, but Zakin tells him to chill out and sit down on his seat, as he doesn't think this man is here for a fight. Raf smiles at Zakin and acknowledges that he seems to have more brains than most of the sorcerers he knows while Zakin wonders why does this sacred knight who supposedly killed 499 sorcerers not emanating any aura of animosity or violence. Zakin offers him a seat and claims that they can have a chat and the knight gladly accepts it and sits down in front of the archdemon. Meanwhile Barb heads behind the counter as the bar owner cries to him to make sure her daughter doesn't die. Barb has never really used his spells for good, 
so this is a first for him as he tries to use healing spells on her with a stressed look. Zakin thinks that he has asked this man to sit down for a talk, but he doesn't really have anything to talk. He thinks about how much he would like to be in Barb's position and help the girl even though she doesn't even need anything as she is just knocked out for a while. He turns towards Raph once again and asks whether he had any business with him. Raph picks his beer up and tells him that he heard that an archdemon has been tangling with his sacred knights and asks whether he is the one. Zakin immediately realizes that he is talking about Chastel as he claims that he mustn't look very much like an evil archdemon at which the knight laughs and claims that despite of his small size, he does have the villainous look to his face that he heard about so much. Zakin snaps back at him by claiming that he heard about his hobby of killing sorcerers and asks why the hell is he so calm when there are two sorcerers right in front of him. Raph takes a huge gulp as he replies that all he has done is snuff out embers that were going to become a wild fire one day. Zakin seems confused as he expected someone who has killed 500 sorcerers to be more brutish and brash, but this man seems to be much more intelligent. Raph breaks the silence and straight up asks whether he has fought any battles with the Sacred Knight Chastel, and if he did, was she ever a threat to him? Zakin honestly replies that he doesn't know how much of a threat she was to him, but he knows for sure that she was the most formidable opponent he ever faced. Raph immediately claims that this means she is of no use to the church and should be dispatched off immediately. Zakin seems confused and asks what the hell is he talking about and Raph reveals that when the church wanted to continue their hunt for the new archdemon, she objected it and even gave up her position of a sacred knight. According to him, this gives the church enough reason to dispose of her. Zakin gets surprised at this as he wonders how the hell could she put herself in such an awkward position and how he agrees that if she genuinely said this, she is of any use to them. Finally Raph gets up from his chair and tells Zakin that his business here is concluded so he will take his leave, but Zakin realizes that this man only came here to confirm the link between him and Chastel which will give him a valid reason to destroy her. He stops him midway and tells Raph that Chastel happens to have many friends in this town who will really mourn her death, and this town happens to be his territory so if Raph steps out of bound and does anything crazy, he will be dealt with accordingly. Raph claims that he never expected an archdemon to care about humans, but Zakin tells him to stay in his limits if he wants to stay alive and take it as a serious threat. Raph ends up laughing heartily at this as he claims that Zakin is exactly as he thought he was and thinks that the church needs to snuff out this ember as well before it turns into an inferno. Barb looks at Zakin and asks what the hell is he trying to pull off and suggests that he should kill the knight at any moment he can. Zakin looks down and tells him to help him then. Barb immediately grabs him by his collar, asking whether he wants Barb to die. But Zakin tells him that he wants him to go to the church and check on Chastel once to make sure she is okay. He has an advanced understanding of teleportation magic which will make it easy for him. He promises to add a couple of extra books for his trouble so Barb gets up and teleports away, while leaving the bar tab for Zakin. A little while later he returns back home only to find Nephi waiting for him near the throne. He tells her that she should have slept, but she claims that Vale wanted to wait for him to come back, but she ended up sleeping because of exhaustion as she worked a lot the entire day. She brought all the books back from the library and already arranged it so that he can read them immediately. Zakin sits beside Nephi and a moment arises where they were just about to kiss when Barb starts teleporting inside the castle as he shouts out for Zakin. He brings his head out while Zakin stands in front of him furious at him for ruining the moment which confuses Barb who doesn't know about it. He immediately comes out alongside Chastel in his arms who looks pale. He tells Zakin that she seems to have been poisoned and Zakin immediately tells Nephi to get his things ready for the treatment. They all huddle around Chastel when Vale wakes up from her sleep only to see a knight with a sacred sword in front of her. Hatred boils from inside of her as she loses control and changes her dragon claw before attacking an unconscious Chastel. Thankfully for her, Zakin was there, and he grabs her arm telling her to chill out. She looks angrily at Zakin and asks what the hell does he think he is doing. But Zakin claims that Chastel is against her, and he will not allow her to be harmed. Vale still seems to be angry as Zakin asks whether she is mad this night in particular. Vale replies that she wants to kill any knight with a sacred sword as one of them killed his father by the time she tried to come back. 
He tells her that killing Chastel, who has nothing to do with her father, will bring her no joy or solace as regardless of whether Chastel lives or die, the actual killer will keep on living as he wants. She asks what the hell does he even know about taking revenge, and he very eloquently replies that the revenge is best when you find the person and break them down physically and mentally, pushing them into despair to a point where they ask for death themselves, but you don't give it to them when they want it the most but you keep them barely alive for a long time till your soul is satisfied. This answer shocks both her and Nephi when Vale asks whether he ever took revenge on someone. Zakin replies that he did, but the person died immediately and he didn't get any joy out of it because of that. He tells her not to worry as once when they find the actual killer, she can bring him back here as Zakin has top-notch torture devices that she can use. This again surprised both Nephi and Vale as they can't understand what kind of man this archdemon is. Some time later, Chastel finally wakes up to find Zakin sitting near her. He tells her that she was poisoned and it was only thanks to Nephi that she is alive. She tells him that she has no idea who poisoned her as she went out to meet a stranger who sent her a letter. The stranger claimed to be from a secret organization in the church which wants to maintain coexistence with the sorcerers but didn't explain before leaving. When she came back, her tea was there and she got poisoned just before Barb came. Zakin claims that it can't be Raph as he would straight up chop her head if he wants to which Chastel agrees with and goes back to bed. The next morning she is forced to dress up as a maid as Zakin tells her that she can stay here for her own protection, but needs to earn her keep. She spots Vale once again since the first time they met in the market, and tries to greet her warmly, but Vale doesn't seem to have any sympathy for her as she calls her stupid before running away. Zakin apologizes for her and reveals that when she was young, her father was killed by one of the sacred sword holders, and ever since she has been hating the church and its knights. Chastel feels bad for her and asks whether it would be better if she would leave, but Zakin tells her not to worry as Vale is just a kid who is unable to express her feelings and assures her that she wouldn't harm her because she has her own pride. She starts working in his household as a maid more or less, but even though Vale promised not to hurt her. She starts pulling pranks on her as she throws a frog on her before running away. Zakin comes running from the library to check on her only to find the sacred knight crying on the floor as she is scared of frogs. Zakin tells her to deal with it, as he never promised Vale would never try to mess with her. Sure enough, she pops her head in again and throws some more frogs on her as she falls on the ground crying after she slips. Zakin wonders how the hell did this woman ever survive as she seems to be completely useless outside a fight. That night Vale starts writing her diary again in which she puts in that the new sacred knight seems to be a total dumbo who doesn't deserve a fancy name like Chastel. She write down that she is incredibly easy to prank as she can simply throw some peels in her way and she will definitely slip on them. She wonders how the hell this woman ever became a knight if she can't even dodge a banana peel. She also writes down that the woman seems to be scared of almost anything that moves like spiders or snakes and starts running away at the first sight of them. She claims that messing with her is way too easy, and it's becoming boring to be honest. She closes her book when there is a knock at the door as Zakin comes in the room and sits by her. Vale expected him to shout at her for messing with the knight, but he claims that apart from the meals she can mess with her as much as she wants. He comes to the main topic as he tells Vale that he knows that she likes living here, but at the same point he also knows that she has unfinished business elsewhere. He tells her that she can leave whenever she wants, but she should know that his doors will always be open for her and Nephi will be waiting for her when she comes back. Vale seems much happier after this talk and goes back to sleep. Meanwhile Nephi and Chastel take a warm bath together in the newly made bathhouse before heading to sleep. While sleeping, Vale ends up having a nightmare about how she found her father dead and a sacred knight bending over him, which wakes her up. She anxiously heads back to Chastel's room and takes out her claws before going near her. To everyone's surprise though, she simply starts pinching her cheeks softly, wondering how this woman ever survived in battle as she sleeps like a log. A little while later while Zakin was sleeping on his throne, Nephi comes running up to him screaming his name before telling him that Vale has disappeared from her room and is nowhere to be found around the castle. A while ago, Vale was in her room, writing her daily diary entry. She writes about how Zakin asked her to be his and Nephi's daughter today, which was a great surprise, but she was happy to hear that. She admits to herself that she likes being here, 
getting head pats from Zakin and hugs from Nephi. However, that poses a dilemma to her. She wants to stay here so much that she is sure that it will make her forget about her revenge, but she does not want to do that at any cost. That is why Vale decides that she cannot live with Zakin any longer. She pens down the last words of her archdemon observation diary and closes it with a heavy heart. She flies out of the castle, thanking Zakin for asking her to be his daughter and giving her the right to make the decision. She soon comes to an underground stairway leading to the castle of the previous archdemon and begins descending, unaware that someone is following her. Vale soon comes to the gates of the castle and thinks that inside, she can find enough knowledge and power to kill a sacred sword wielder. Zakin has arranged it so that she can enter the castle on her own. However, as Vale tries to unlock the doors of the castle, she hesitates, realizing that if she takes something from the castle without telling Zakin, she would be betraying him. Just as she opens the door a little bit, she hears someone's voice from behind. She panics as she turns around and finds that Raph followed her here. But when she sees the sacred sword behind his back, the horrible memories of her past come back to her. She recalls the sacred knight who was smeared in blood and eating the dragon's flesh. Even though she could not see his face clearly then, she can recognize the scar on his face clearly enough to know that he is the man who killed her father. Raph asks her who she is, and Vale's rage overtakes her rationality. She transforms her hands into dragon claws and sprouts her wings to charge at him. Raph draws his sword and swings it towards her, and Vale realizes that attacking in Sacred Night without a plan was suicide. She realizes she is doomed, and in that moment of helplessness, she can only call for Zakin, and he arrives at the scene just as Raph's sword is about to hit Vale. Zakin blocks the sword and then tells Vale that he will impose a curfew so that she cannot leave the house so late at night. Vale is shocked to see him here and asks how he came here. He replies that he was sure that she was going to come here, so he took help from Barb to teleport her. Just as he says this, Barb also appears there and tells Zakin that he is not his personal Uber. Vale has not received the answer to her question, and she asks Zakin why he is here when she betrayed him. He simply tells her to stop worrying about every little thing and gently pats her head, causing Vale to give up on running away. She hugs Zakin and apologizes for running away while crying, and he softly smiles at her. Nephi is on the other side of Barb's portal, and since she is also worried, Zakin assures her that Vale is safe with him, and they will return home soon after dealing with another problem. With that, he leaves Raph's sacred sword, and then tells him that he was already warned about not overstepping his limits. Raph laughs at him, asking since when do sorcerers protect others? Zakin tells him that Vale is his daughter, and the Sacred Knight is taken aback on hearing that. Zakin then asks Vale to step back and tells Raph to defend with everything he has got if he doesn't want to die. Raph declares that it is not time for him to die yet, and unleashes the true power of his holy sword Metatron. The sword is covered in a blue flame and emits a strong pressure that cracks Zakin's magic circle. Raph boasts that his sword has the fire of purification that once killed an archdemon and burnt away all their magic. Vale and Barb are worried now, but Zakin tells his daughter that he will teach her how to get revenge now. He says that by allowing the enemy to show their full power and then crushing it, they can have the most satisfying revenge. Zakin charges at Rop, who swings his sacred sword at him. To his surprise, Zakin blocks his attack with a magic barrier that does not disappear even after coming in contact with the flames of purification. Zakin explains that from the experience he had while fighting Chastel, he improved his barrier. His latest defensive barrier is called Heaven's Scale, and it constantly draws magic from the air to repair itself into best condition. He then pushes Raph back who reactivates the fire of purification and charges ahead. He swings his sword at Zakin, but manages to hit only the ground. Even then, his strike is so powerful that it creates a giant hole in front of him and sets it on fire. Zakin has easily dodged the attack, and when Raf attacks him again, he simply pushes him back with his unbreakable barrier. The Sacred Knight attacks him again, and this time, he manages to destroy the barrier, Zakin remarks that his barrier is still far from perfection if it could take only three hits. 
Raph lunges at him again, and Zakin uses physical strengthening magic to punch him into the castle door. With the annoying flames of purification gone, he can use all types of magic freely. Vale applauds him, and Zakin appreciates her reaction. He then returns his focus to the fight, and thinks that Raph must be defeated now, because sacred knights aren't as powerful as sorcerers in the end. To his surprise, Raph still gets up, and remarks that he is quite strong. On the other hand, Chastel visits Nephi and asks where Zakin is. She is a bit nervous on seeing the dark shadow on the floor, and Nephi tells her about Vale's disappearance and how Zakin is protecting her from an attacker. Chastel is torn between the desire to go and help Zakin, and the desire to stay behind since she must be the reason Vale left the house. Unable to come to a decision, she falls to her knees and begins worrying about her future. She is certain that the church will kill her now, and wonders if she should side with the sorcerers now. She dismisses the idea, and then Nephi tries to comfort her. Chastel asks her if she is not going, and Nephi replies that Zakin has ordered her to stay here. Chastel tells Nephi that she is envious of her, and she returns the sentiment. Chastel is taken aback and starts laughing, saying that Nephi has no reason to be jealous, but she replies that Chastel can freely go to Zakin. On the other hand, she has orders to stay behind. Chastel yells that if she wants to go to Zakin, she can just disobey his orders, but Nephi refuses to do so. She takes Chastel by surprise and hugs her, saying that her job is to welcome Zakin home like a proper housewife. Chastel begins crying, saying that she would also like to help Zakin in any way, even though she is supposed to be his sworn enemy. Her tears don't stop flowing as she confesses how confused and clueless she is about what to do now. She doesn't want to fight Zakin, and instead wants to fight by his side. Nephi ruffles her hair and says that she already knows what to do. She talks about how during their first meeting, Chastil said that Zakin looked lonely. Nephi says that she was jealous that someone other than her could also understand Zakin, but she was also glad that there are people who can understand him. Seeing her so calm, Chastel realizes that Nephi has grown a lot because she can freely love Zakin. Thanks to her words, Chastel now knows what to do. She jumps into the shadow on the floor without any hesitation and reaches the cave, where Raph is still standing despite taking serious injuries. He takes a deep breath, and his injuries heal instantly, making Zakin realize that the rumors about him consuming dragon flesh were true. Zakin tells Vale that it is a good thing that Raph won't die so easily, because that will give her a lot of time to punish him thoroughly. Raph remarks that he seems to be hated a lot here, and Vale tells him that her father Orobas was her pride and job, but he killed him. The Sacred Knight is shocked to learn this, and so are Zakin and Barb. Orobas was a legendary dragon who had lived for over a thousand years, and Zakin doesn't think that someone won Raph's level could defeat him. Vale continues her dialogue, saying that her dad was kind, wise and helpful, and people called him the Sage Dragon. One day, some holy knights came calling him, and he left with them. He never returned home, and when Vale decided to go looking for him after a week, she found her dad's corpse stabbed by a sacred sword, and a demonic-looking man drinking his blood. That sight was too much for her to bear, and she lost the energy to fly anymore. She crashed to the ground, and the grief of losing her father started setting into her heart gradually. She recalled how many times her dad helped the humans, and they betrayed him in the end. As she finishes her story, Raph tells Vale that if she is the daughter of Orobos, he will kill her too. He charges towards her, but Zakin steps in between them and hits him away with his physical strengthening magic. Raph lands on his feet and once again charges towards Vale, who decides to blow him away with her magic. Zakin tries to stop her, but it is too late, and her draconic magic clashes with the sacred sword of Raph. However, when the dust of the explosion clears, it turns out that Chastel had arrived at the scene at the right time, and she is the one holding Raph back. Barb panics upon realizing that he forgot to close the portal, and Zakin is amazed that Chastel was able to stop Vale and Raph at once. 
Meanwhile, Vale is confused about what Chastel is doing here. She replies that they have not gotten along even once, but she just wants to have a proper chat with her. Zakin pats Vale's head, saying that she should also try solving their issues through a conversation. He then turns his attention to the injured Raph who is on his knees now, and asks him why is he planning to die so pathetically. He says that there is no fun in killing someone who is practically begging to be killed, and both Vale and Chastil are shocked to hear this. Zakin explains that the moment Raph heard the name Orobas, all his bloodlust and determination vanished. Chastil suddenly realizes something on hearing this, and asks Raph if he was the one who sent her the letter under the name of Orobas. Zakin is confused now, and he asks Raph to explain things clearly. Suddenly, Zakin feels a strange and intimidating energy coming from within the Archdemon's castle. The Guardian Golem that was lying dormant within the castle makes its way out of the broken gate, and the dark aura it releases is so intense that Chastel has trouble breathing. As the Golem emerges out of the gate completely, Zakin realizes that it emits the same aura as a demon, but it is not nearly as terrifying. He realizes that the golem has been modeled after demons, and then notices it absorbing mana from the surrounding to power itself. Zakin believes that at this rate he will suck every life force near it dry, and the effects have already started to show on Chastel. Vale tells Zakin that it is the guardian of the castle, and he realizes that the clash of the sacred swords must have activated it. He tries commanding the golem to return using his archdemon crest, but it does not work. Suddenly, the golem's head starts twisting, and it opens its jaw wide to unleash a powerful beam at them. Zakin tells everyone to dodge, and he has barely enough time to grab Chastel and move out of the beam's way. He panics when he notices that Vale could not get out safely, and she gets hit by the golem's beam. However, she is not hurt at all. As Vale opens her eyes, she finds that Raph used his body to shield her, even losing an arm in the process. Everyone is shocked to see that, and Zakin is enraged at the golem. He uses his advanced barrier spell and bashes the golem with it, casting it to the ground and destroying it successfully. He then rushes to Vale, asking if she is alright. She is fine but Raph has taken a very critical wound that is too much even for his dragon powers to heal. Zakin asks him why he did this, and the Sacred Knight replies that he just fulfilled his duty. Raph tries to get up but fails, and Zakin remarks that he seems to be aiming for some sort of redemption. He asks Raph to explain himself, and the old knight struggles to keep breathing while he looks at Vale, who reminds him of her dad Orobas. Raph gets up and tells Vale that he did not kill her dad, because the great dragon Orobas would never be defeated by a normal human like him. Vale doesn't believe him and repeats that she saw him consuming her dad's flesh that day. She is sure that Raph somehow tricked him, and he asks her if the Orobas was so weak that he could be defeated by a mere human's treachery. Vale can't understand anything, so Raph gets to the point. He tells her that he sought out the help of Orobas because he wanted to kill a demon, an enemy that he could not have handled with just human troops. Everyone is shocked to hear this, but Vale still thinks that Raph is lying because demons are just found in myths. However, Raph insists that he fought against the demon along with Orobas and many other holy knights that day, and most of them ended up dead. He believes that more demons will come to Earth soon, pronouncing its end. Vale looks to Zakin, who reveals that he once faced the shadow of a demon, and he is certain that they still exist in some dimension. He says that he has been researching ancient texts to find out things about them, and reminds Vale that she has been helping him with that. Vale is aghast that her dad fought a demon and lost, but Raph tells her that Orobas didn't lose, he won at the price of his life. She cries, asking who should she hate then, and Raph tells her that she should let go of her hatred and feel proud of her father's actions. He says that demons are too powerful. And if they invade the Earth when the Holy Knights and Sorcerers still fight with each other, Earth will stand no chance against them. Orobas foresaw that, and he told Raph to keep on living so that he could make the Earth strong enough to defend itself. That is why, he did the foulest thing imaginable and consumed the blood of his friend. Raph says that his mission is over now because he has met with Chastel who can act as a bridge between the Church and the Sorcerers. 
He declares that dying in the name of Orobas will be the greatest last mission for him. These words convince Zakin that Raph was the strange guy who met with Chastel earlier and talked about the coexistence of the church and the sorcerers. But Barb doesn't buy it. He tells Raph that he has no right to talk about coexistence after killing hundreds of sorcerers. And he agrees. He says that the only one who can lead a coexistence is Chastel, and she panics because she has not yet accepted the job. Suddenly, the golem begins moving and taking shape again, and Zakin decides to deal with it quickly. He thinks that since the golem must be made with magic, he can just disable the magic like he always does. However, Raph warns him that the golem is made with something else than magic. It has some demonic traces in it. He is confident that the traces are from the same demon that he and Orobas slayed, and the previous archdemon just took its corpse and turned it into a chimera. That doesn't phase Zakin in the least, and he gets ready to try some new spells against the demon chimera. Suddenly, Chastel steps up to him and asks him to let her fight alongside him. She draws her sacred sword after purging all doubts from her mind and asks it to lend her power. The sword is suddenly covered in golden flames of purification, and Zakin notices that her flames are more tightly connected to the sword compared to Raph. The golem charges its attack and Chastel suddenly runs towards it despite Zakin's warning. She counters the golem's beam with her sword, splitting it in two and creating an opening for Zakin to attack. He rushes ahead and hits the golem with his advanced barrier, shattering its arm. However, dark fumes appear in place of the broken arm, and the shards of the stone begin floating around and change their direction to face Zakin. The golem suddenly shoots them all towards Zakin, but then Chastel rushes to cover for him once again and slashes all the rocks. Even Zakin is intimidated by her speed and power now, and he is glad that she is on his side. He then uses a modified version of his advanced barrier and punches the golem before snapping his fingers and letting dark flames erupt from where he marked it earlier. The golem is reduced to rubble in seconds, and Zakin is pleased with his victory. Chastel asks him what did he just do, and he tells her that he used the opposite spell of his advanced barrier. His new spell absorbs mana from the surrounding continuously and then burns it in a black fire. Zakin says that his advanced barrier and the black flame technique are just the same thing, but reversed in direction. He has created them to face sacred knights and demons, but they are far from perfection right now. Chastel says that he is quite a fearsome sorcerer, and he says that she is quite talented too. She blushes on hearing that, and then promises to stand by his side in the future too. Just then, Vale calls for Zakin's attention towards Raph who is bleeding out. Zakin tries healing him with magic, but his wound is too deep. Raph talks about how Chastel just turned out to be the fastest holy knight he has ever seen. He tells her that she may not accept the role he offered her, but her actions have already made her the symbol of coexistence. He tells her that this coexistence faction was the idea of Orobas, and he just wants to make it come true. Zakin helps him up and asks why did he kill so many sorcerers then? Raph tells him that he never wished to kill them, but the sorcerers attacked him first. He says that he always wanted to have a friendly chat with him and even tried to laugh to ease the tension, but they still attacked him first and he was forced to end their life. This shocks everyone and Zakin and others tell the old holy knight that he is completely tone deaf and no matter what he does, he always comes across as a threatening individual. Ignoring all this, Raph asks Chastel to return to the church and he promises to deal with the people who were trying to harm her. She asks him if he knows their identity and he tells her that deep inside her heart, she should know it too. He gets up, asking Vale to let him ensure Chastel's safety before she can take his life. Vale just asks him what did he think about her dad, and Raph immediately replies that Arobas was a grand dragon, and the moments he spent fighting alongside him were the most glorious moments of his life. With that, he marches on ahead, and Zakin asks Vale if she is going to let him go. She says that she doesn't feel that killing him is the right thing now and he pats her head, saying that she made the right choice. He then tells her to return home where Napi is waiting and Vale gladly takes his hand. Barb teleports them all back to Zakin's castle, where Nephi is waiting for them at the gate. On the other hand, the priest is talking with Chastel's lackeys about how worried he is about her. He sends them to rest because they have spent the entire day looking for her, but once he is left alone, he shows his true colors. He expresses his frustration because Chastel is not dead yet. 
He believes that all sorcerers are evil and Chastel is evil too because she took their side. He was even pushing for her execution, but the other priests objected, and then even Raph came to the scene. He was the one who tried to poison her so that her sacred sword would choose another master. It was not his first time doing that either, because he has killed many sacred knights just because they didn't agree with his ideology. He opens a secret drawer in his desk and takes out a bottle of poison from it, when suddenly, Raph kicks open the door to his room. The priest shows concern about his missing arm, but Rop tells him that it is but a scratch. He falls to his knees halfway into the room, and the priest takes this as a chance to eliminate him because he can't understand which side he is on. He pours the poison onto his gloves and tries applying it on Raph's wound by calling it a medicine. However, Raph simply cuts off the priest's hand and then tells him that he knows everything about his treachery. The priest screams and rolls in pain, and Raph puts his boot inside his mind to shut him up. He tells him that he has no right to snuff the bright future, and then stabs him with his sacred sword. After killing the priest, Raph tells him that he will join him in the afterlife soon. The next day, Chastel has tea with Zakin and Nephi, where she learns that the priest was indeed the person who was after her life. She had her suspicions about him because he always claimed how the church was always right. She knows that he was wrong and delusional like any other boomer out there, and now she wants to change the church a little at a time. That is why, she plans to return to the church. Zakin suddenly tells her that her tea is poisoned and Chastel freaks out. He tells her that he was just joking, but this was also his way of showing her that she trusts others too easily and that is a problem. Chastel is flustered and says that she almost spilled the tea Nephi made, and Zakin corrects her, saying that someone else made the tea. Vale had been hiding behind the couch all this time, so Chastel goes to speak with her. She kneels before her and tries caressing her, but Vale is not ready for that. Chastel accepts that and starts leaving, but then Vale tells her to come again. She is moved to tears on hearing that and returns to the door, promising to try and make the world a better place for sorcerers. Suddenly, Raph places his hand on her shoulder and tells her to ask for his help if she needs it. She agrees, but then freaks out on seeing that Raph is still alive. He has a casual chat with Zakin about how his healing and Oroba's blessing made him recover from the injury quickly while Chastel freaks out that they are having such casual conversation. She thought that he was already dead, but Zakin tells her that he was the one who told him about the priest. Coincidentally, he also made the tea and not veil, because he has sworn to become Zakin's butler from now on and resigned as the commander of Holy Knights. Chastel freaks out again on hearing this. Yesterday, Raph came to their castle after killing the priest and offered to die at Vale's hand if she wanted it. Zakin left the decision entirely to the dragon girl, and after some thought, she told Raph that he should serve Zakin and Nephi because that would help her too. Well, the old knight is excellent in housework, and Zakin also relates with him because both of them have a very nasty image even though they are not bad people. Meanwhile, Vale asks Raph if he misses his hand, and then brings the armor piece that she used to pretend to be a big guy. She attaches it to Raph's shoulder, and then fixes it with magic, allowing it to move like a real arm. The old knight is touched and swears to serve Vale for the rest of his life. After hearing all this, Chastel tears up when she realizes that she is the only one moving out. Zakin tells her to stop crying because she is always welcome back, and everyone will be glad to have her. She is delighted on hearing this, and she cheerfully takes off. Just then, Barb comes out of Zakin's shadow, yawning and stretching, telling him to get breakfast ready. Zakin, however, tells him to go along with Chastil because she could use some extra protection since she is too naive. Barb doesn't want to be a babysitter, but Zakin promises to pay him for that, and he immediately starts tailing Chastil and attaches himself to her shadow. After they leave, Zakin notices that Nephi suddenly became upset. He asks her the reason, and she coyly clings to his arm as she asks him to try and understand. Zakin racks her brain, and then gently holds Nephi's face, apologizing for leaving her behind last night. Apparently, that was what she wanted to hear, and she happily hugs him. Meanwhile, Raph closes Vale's eyes, telling her that she is too young to be seeing stuff like this. If you liked this video, make sure to subscribe for part 12, and make sure to check out this brand new anime about a loser who gets reincarnated as a prince with godly abilities.